After more than a century of war with the Crusades following a brief period of stability and peace, in July 1569, during the Union of Lublin, the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania formed a single commonwealth, the Rzecz Pospolita. At its height, it was the largest European state, four times the size of the United Kingdom as it is right now, and it lasted for slightly more than two centuries. Rzecz Pospolita was a monarchy, but in reality it was ruled by the power of veto, where any nobleman had the right to say no to any law rendering it impossible to govern through corruption and bribery as status quo was maintained by foreign interests. Until on the 5th of August 1772, those foreign interests, being the Kingdom of Prussia, the Habsburg monarchy and the Russian Empire started parceling the land for themselves in what was known as the Partitions of Poland. There were a total of three partitions, the second happening on the 23rd of January 1793, and then finally on the 24th of October 1795, Rzecz Pospolita and consequentially Lithuania was no more. But what was Lithuania? Had it not stopped being Lithuania for two centuries already? What in that instance defines Lithuania? Is it the rulers? The borders? The people? The language? Well, my answer is some or all of these unified by the concept of cultural identity. If I asked you to sum up America in one sentence, you could say, right, okay, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Well, not now, obviously, but you get the idea. Or, for a better example, take Cornwall. Unlike Scotland, Northern Ireland or Wales, Cornwall does not count as a distinct part of the United Kingdom. It does not have a parliament, it doesn't have any borders, and for all intents and purposes, it's just another county in England. But ask any Cornish person and they will tell you that they are Cornish before they are English unless they tell you that they're not English at all. They count as their own ethnic group and they have their own language and Cornish identity is officially recognized by the census. There is a Cornish cultural identity just like in 1795 there was a Lithuanian cultural identity. Most of the territory that I and the world has come to identify as Lithuania now fell under the control of the Russian Empire. But how do you convince a nation that has seen itself as Lithuania for nearly a millennium to now see themselves as Russian? One option is to suppress or destroy cultural identity. Printed Lithuanian word was prohibited under the punishment of death and spoken Lithuanian word was highly discouraged. It was mocked and painted as something only to be used by the lowest classes, which obviously massively misfired. Russia had not done its research. If there's one thing Lithuanians are incredibly proud of and incredibly possessive of is our language. Lithuanian belongs to the Baltic language group, which has three languages, Lithuanian, Latvian and Prussian. Oddly enough, that's not the same Prussia as one of the three partitioners, the Kingdom of Prussia. It was rather what are now known as Old Prussians, a cultural group known for their rejection of excess, incredible hospitality and massive drinking. I mean, if you wanted to get down in medieval Europe, Prussia was the place to be. Of course, that was too much fun for the Crusades, so they had to go and wipe them off the face of the planet. Funny how all these stories end in colonialism. Lithuania responded with multiple revolts and fierce efforts to maintain and preserve our language. Foreign presses were commissioned to print books, textbooks, pamphlets and periodicals. The publisher of one such periodical, Varpas, which translates to The Bell, Vincis Kudirka, became not only the writer of our anthem but also a national hero. And I mention this to emphasize that this wasn't just something people did as a hobby. This was the stuff of secret societies and the underground, ridiculously dangerous, yet operated on a national scale. 
Book smuggling was a profession where every journey could have been your last because the borders were under constant Russian patrol and anyone found with Lithuanian literature was killed. No questions asked. And thus, Lithuanian cultural identity survived on the one thing we shared, our words. The next bit is incredibly convoluted, so historians forgive me for the gross oversimplification. In 1915, in the waves of World War I, Germany takes control of Lithuania from Russia. On the 16th of February, the date we are recording this video, 1918, Lithuania declares independence from all previous states. Three wars followed, two with Russia, one with Poland, and on the 12th of July 1920, Soviet forces officially recognized Lithuania as an independent state. We are born again. Once we were this, now and forever we are this. But sometimes forever only lasts 20 years. A lot of weird things happen to a country that regains its independence. Absence of control creates power vacuums, and power vacuums create opportunities. And opportunities, by their nature, will be exploited. We as gamers know this very well. Shortly after regaining independence, Lithuania became an authoritarian state. President Antanas Smetona had such a cult of personality that even when I learned about him in school, he was portrayed as this benevolent leader. In 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union signed the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, where foreign nations once again agreed to just have us, without anyone asking whether we'd like that or not. So that's how we became part of the Soviet Union? Oh my, no. In 1941, German forces invade Lithuania. People are sent to concentration camps and the country is torn to shreds. In 1944, Germany is weakened and Soviet forces march in and Lithuania changes hands one more time. Like a people-filled hacky sack, being kicked about by imperial forces. Gorbachev's perestroika eventually led to the crumbling of the Soviet Union, and I remember being five years old and watching on the telly the people of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia form a single uninterrupted line, holding hands in unity all the way across three countries. On 11th of March, 1990, Lithuania declares the re-establishment of independence. Eleven months later, Iceland is the first country to recognize us as an independent state. Thanks, Iceland. Finally, freedom. Finally, yet another power vacuum. If you're here for the board game content, thank you for persevering through this unusually long intro. Today we'll be talking about colonialism in board games, a subject so heady that some people immediately dive for the bushes when they hear it. For your convenience, we provided a bush at the corner of this video. When you start feeling like it's just a little bit too much, feel free to uh, plonk yourself right over here. I don't think I need to list my credentials as a board gamesman, but some of you might not know that during my academic years I studied creative writing, and when I got a degree in that, I moved on to a master's by research in post-colonial literature. So in some ways, for me, this video is like two worlds colliding. I wanted to talk about this for so long, and yet I didn't. Colonialism isn't just a difficult subject, it's pervasive. So much of our history, and therefore who we are, is shaped by it. It has affected literally everything. Almost anywhere you are in the world, apart from Iceland maybe, has colonial roots. Either your country was annexed, pillaged, or destroyed, or it was doing the annexing, pillaging, or destroying. Or both. When I say the word colonialism, predominantly Western audiences probably imagine England or France traipsing over places where they don't belong, but that's not very useful. What I want you to imagine instead is something more nebulous, something all-encompassing, something inexorable. 
because for a lot of people, colonialism is personal. After the Soviet Union occupied Lithuania for the final time, a lot of regular people took up arms and went into the woods. They were the rebellion, the partisans. My grandmother's brother was one of those people. He too went into the woods and one day he just never returned. We don't actually know what happened to him, but we can assume that it's the same thing that happened to every other partisan. He was captured, mercilessly tortured for information, and then shot. And my mum never even got to meet her uncle. And that's just one story in a melting pot of horror. I wanted to share this with you, not just because it frames the entire conversation, but also because that's the only way I can speak on this subject authoritatively. As a Lithuanian, I get to own this. My family lived this pain, my country lived this pain, and others shared a pain much greater. When I was planning this script out, here is where I thought I would put in some numbers, some statistics to really hammer in the effects of colonialism. But the more research I did, the more I realized that any number I put in here is meaningless. For example, according to an article in 15 Minutes, which is a popular Lithuanian periodical, 131,600 Lithuanians have been sent to Siberian gulags between the years of 1940 and 1953. Another 156,000 have been sent to various other internment camps across the Soviet Union. One in ten of these were children. At least 5,000 children died just on the way to the gulags themselves. It's obviously monstrous, but that's just a tiny sliver of my country's colonial history. And my country's colonial history is just a tiny sliver in colonial history. Instead of numbers and statistics, I'd rather you consider this. Colonialism is the opportunity denied. It is the history that was instead of the history that could have been. It is a dream crushed. Whenever conversations about colonialism in board games spring up, we immediately treat it, as Lindsay Ellis would put it, thing bad. And don't get me wrong, this isn't some weird colonialist apologist video, it absolutely is a bad thing. But just knowing the adjective for it doesn't help us understand it. And to understand it, first, we need stats. Let's ask the question, is colonialism a pervasive subject in board games? Well, according to Board Game Geek, as of writing, there are 99,597 board games in existence, and only 130 of them have the tag of theme colonial. Well, that's 0.13%. I guess that's the problem solved and the end of the video. Goodbye, everybody. Wait a minute. Just looked into the exploration tag. The very second entry here is a game called Age of Discovery, but it doesn't really have the tag of theme colonialism, so this is probably fine. Let's just see what the description says. In Age of Discovery, the players supply famous expeditions of well-known explorers like Columbus. I started to realize that some board game geek users might not have the same definition of colonialism as the rest of the world does. All the information is user added and edited. So a game like Imperial Struggle here features tags like Age of Reason or War Game, but not theme colonialism. And it's so obviously about colonialism. Finding an actual statistical representation of how pervasive this theme is, is probably impossible. But what we can do is infer. If we go by the definition of colonialism, which according to Oxford languages is, the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it economically. And then apply that definition to the top 100 ranked games on Board Game Geek, we get about 15 games that either match or closely relate to that description via the settings they adopt. If we also include games that don't feature a real historical element or a fictionalized setting, like space, then we get about 23. This obviously isn't a scientific measure, especially because as we go down in rankings, the setting of colonialism becomes less 
prominent. But with so many people's favourite games having colonialist undertones, I think it's pretty fair to say that the answer to the question, is colonialism a pervasive subject in board games, is yes. Very. So then the next question we should ask is why? I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around this subject by general audiences because we have been conditioned to think that settings of games don't matter. After stepping down as chairman of Spiel des Jahres, the most prestigious award in the hobby board game sphere, Tom Felber later wrote an article on his blog called 10 Not Necessarily Nice Things I Want to Say at the end. In one tangent, he bemoans how the focus of making games has shifted from endless iteration and perfecting mechanisms to gussied up productions. I mention this not to knock Tom, although honestly not a fan of that article, but to give an understanding how the German board game scene, which is foundational to our hobby, has developed. There is an elephant in this room, and the elephant is that instead of saying theme in this video, I've been saying setting. We have adopted theme as a catch-all phrase, but most of the time it doesn't really mean what we want it to mean. What we mean when we say theme is setting, and if we're lucky, those two might overlap. For example, the setting of a game like Splendor is trading jewels in the Renaissance period, whereas the theme of the game Splendor is something that the gameplay might evoke, which I guess in this case is investing into a collection portfolio. In some ways, Tom is right. The German board game scene catapulted by the success of games like Modern Art and Settlers of Catan was hyper-focused on creating systems. But obviously systems alone are not enough to sell them or to explain them. You need setting to ground them. The problem is that designing a good board game and telling a good story are two entirely different skill sets that don't necessarily complement each other. I remember reviewing Maracaibo last year, a game where the English, French and Dutch sail about the Caribbean having adventures with hundreds of characters and cards and only two of those characters, the trapper and the native, being not white. Alexander Pfister, the designer of Maracaibo, chimed in in the comments section admitting that all he wanted to do was just make like a Pirates of the Caribbean style adventure. Which is fair, but what we learned today is that historical settings come with their own baggage. It was painful for me personally to review this game just after the height of the Windrush scandal in the United Kingdom. It looks and it acts historically grounded but it absolutely does not understand the subject that it is trading with. Tolkien is slightly poisonous because it's this world, this great world of kings and queens, you know, which is a golden age which has been lost and we're getting back the golden age and isn't everything going to be wonderful again but it never was no i mean tolkien did try and absolve himself by saying that he hates allegory in all its form the right one then this man is keith Jeff. Keith is an experimental poet and a creative writing lecturer at the University of Bedfordshire. He also happens to have been my creative writing lecturer and the person who introduced me to post-colonial theory. When I was doing my degree, my interests largely revolved around the genre of magical realism and writers like Borges or Gabriel Garcia Marquez or Haruki Murakami. Don't judge me, I was very young. I learned that this and other genres were examples of post-colonial work and then my background as a creator was also post-colonial. I always knew my country's history and I understood what it went through but what I didn't understand was that so many places in our world were united in this arrested development. Before we delve deeper into what it is, I want to go over some examples of colonialism in board games. For some, this might be old hat, and for others, a revelation. Puerto Rico is an economic game where workers are depicted via brown cubes. They're called colonialists, but within the fiction of the game, they're brought in via ships from other places 
to do work. Mombasa is a game where you go to Africa, mine diamonds, cook books, establish outposts, and I don't really know if I need to say anything else. Endeavor Age of Sail has a slavery deck. It acknowledges in the rulebook that obviously the slavery deck is problematic, but at least they remain respectful by not writing out history. More on that later. Imperial Struggle is a game about two colonial superpowers, England and France, jockeying for positions in various territories, depicting a not at all fictional conflict with fictional what if historical propositions. Twilight Struggle is a game about two colonial superpowers, USA and the USSR, jockeying for positions in various territories, depicting a not at all fictional conflict with fictional what if historical propositions. I can predict with absolute certainty that even despite me saying this, there'll be comments like, games are not political, it's just set dressing, Efka, leave board games alone. But what I want you to learn today is that they're not. These things games depict don't exist in a vacuum for us to deploy like a rickety seat at a cultural ferris wheel. Games are growing. They are telling more stories. And in turn, those stories become more complicated. Take the trajectory of video games, for example. It's easy to think that when we played Space Invaders, games were just mechanisms. But look at games like Mass Effect or The Last of Us. Board games are becoming more and more elaborate, and it's time we take some ownership over what we, as an art form, want to say to the world. If we want to be relevant, I don't want us, as an industry, to blunder into the cultural scene with egg on our face. Do we, and the stories we tell, want to be taken seriously, or do we want to be a footnote? in a rule book. I'll start by taking ownership myself. I too fell for the theme doesn't matter argument and it was so easy because that's how the entire industry treats it. Heck, we can't even get the term right. I've reviewed games thinking this. It was a long while ago, but I did it and I knew better. I've spent years learning this. Now I'll never fall for this trivialization trap again. So what can we do? I suggest we learn and adapt from mistakes others have made. Music, film, literature, theater, and video games have all dealt with this. They've all grown from mechanical exercises to a global shared characteristic of the Anthropocene. The most immediate and obvious answer is that we must diversify our talent pool. The perspective of different voices can only enrich our discourse. There is everything to gain and nothing to lose. And I have some good news. The Zenobia Award is a grant and mentorship program designed to empower disadvantaged minority voices in the historical war game scene, which is the prime field in board games that most frequently deals with the subject of colonialism. Whilst the Zenobia Award is not set up to receive public donations, one thing we can do is watch and amplify the voices that benefit from it. I've left the relevant links in the description. The other thing publishers can do to understand the topics they are dealing with is hire sensitivity readers, people who have expertise in the subject matter and help you untangle the messy side of culture and history. A practice some publishers started employing is hiring writers. Great, but make sure that your writers are actually knowledgeable about the subject they are dealing with. And this is the crux of the matter and my ultimate verdict to anyone who publishes a game with exploitation. You have no business touching something if A, you don't understand it, or B, you have nothing to add to the conversation. I, I think it, it, it is that, the, the, the separation of issues like colonialism, issues like race, issues like capitalism and exploitation you know most of the the, the, the modern fantasy writers are all as left-wing as hell you know how can i take on that on board that there is no kind of innocent fun here uh but you can still have fun mm. but you have to crunch it a little bit more carefully 
And I think that's where, where the games are, are going to end up having to go. I've purposely inserted Imperial Struggle as an example, even though it and its Twilight cousin deals with colonialism in a very different way. It does have something to say. It's a historical exploration, a what if that puts you in the driver's seat. I guess I'd liken it to a documentary in VR. When Imperial Struggle came out, a phrase was thrown around. Depiction is not endorsement, and I very much agree with that. Except Imperial Struggle does not depict, it simulates, which is a tool magnitudes more powerful. And the danger here is that when simulations make arguments, they hold a lot more gravitas. So the question with games like that always is, what arguments is it making and whose vision is it simulating? Even positive examples of colonialist settings in board games to me lack something. Pax Premier 2nd Edition lets you play from the perspective of the local population taking charge of an invading situation. Yet famously, the 1st edition includes an essay called In Defense of Colonialism, written by a Covid denier. Hi mum, you know how you never met your uncle? Well, it's fine, because a man named Phil Eklund said that it gave us banking. A board game designer. A board game designer. Yeah, no, I have no idea what banking has to do with the Soviet Union, but apparently it's a good thing. Spirit Island is a fantasy game where you play as spirits fighting the onslaught of white men and buildings. These are immensely powerful and I love that these viewpoints exist. What I want you to take away from this isn't that one of these is the right way of doing things and others aren't. I enjoy games like Twilight Imperium. Even though they are undeniably colonialist in setting and theme, they are also absolutely simulations that put me in the driver's seat. But because the setting is so on the nose, nonsense, that's enough for me to distinguish it from reality. But another person might find that horrible and would much prefer a real life historical setting where at least there's nuance. The objective here isn't to dismantle the imperialist yoke, it's to give you tools to tackle these subjects. And also, I would like to make a suggestion. None of these games I mentioned are examples of post-colonial work, and frankly, I struggle to think of an example of post-colonial work in cardboard. I'm slowly coming to the realization that I've spent more than 20 minutes talking without actually explaining what post-colonialism is. And that's because it's the hardest thing. I don't know how to do it. <sighs> okay, think of it as a genre, or better yet, a voice. A voice that speaks in the vacuum that is left by the absence of colonialism. The invaders leave, but life goes on, and people start filling that vacuum, and post-colonialism is stories about those people. They can be macro, dealing with sociological, geographical, or political issues, or they could be micro, dealing with psychology, relationships, and verisimilitude. That's what I want to see more of in board games. I'm not sure that helped. I'd like to echo Keith's words here again. If you don't show yourself in your work, then why are you doing it? Okay, let me flip that on his head. I was monumentally scared talking about the subject. There are nations whose history and culture were affected much worse than mine, but I do it anyway, because I feel like what I have to say is important. And most importantly, my words are personal. This video is sponsored by Skillshare but we decided to donate all the sponsorship money that we make from this video to the Black Trans Foundation Therapy Fund. The fund is set up to provide black trans people and black non-binary people with free counseling and therapy sessions. Skillshare is the online learning community that offers thousands of classes on various subjects, from interior design to photography to even board game design. Skillshare is an invaluable resource for anyone curious and adventurous for anyone who wants to explore something new. I myself have taken multiple courses about learning lighting, and one of the ones I'd recommend is a course by Zach Mulligan called Cinematography Basics, Introduction to Lighting Techniques. Lighting 
is definitely not one of my great passions, but I was surprised by how easy and entertaining it was to learn new tips and tricks. And the results speak for themselves. This is how our videos looked two years ago, last year, and today. You can find many more classes for less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, and the first 1,000 of you to click the link in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership.